Yeah, anyway, stream, well, we're welcoming Guo today. He's a product designer um, and he's a product design intern at Datadog. But more importantly, he runs the Not Just Pixels podcast, which I'm a huge fan of. Uh, and that's actually where I know him. He interviews a bunch of uh, high value UX professionals and aims to show you how to get your first design internship or design job and you know that's actually how I came to know of him and without further ado uh, welcome Guo to our stream um, if you want to see the stream actually I can show you like you're actually oh, no. you're actually on stream so like you're on my stream here people can oh, see you that's so cool yeah so you're on my twitch stream but that's what I wanted to say <laughs> Yeah, that's super cool. Oh yeah, glad to be here. Um, How's your yeah, day? That's a one have a good intro. <laughs> Thank you. How's your day? Well, I mean, I learned from the best. Uh, you've done some really good intros on your show, actually. That's what I really love about the show. But how are you doing today? I'm I'm doing fine. Yeah. Uh, I actually just so I'm running this product club at Tufts, which is my university, and we just organize a Boston-wide weekend design competition and so that was like that was a lot of planning uh it was very hectic oh, but, I see. so I'm kind of like pulling myself back together and just okay. like kind of processing what just happened last weekend and uh, it, it was a good event a lot of things that we can improve on and yeah I see so what exactly did you guys do in the event yeah so it's a 36 hour design competition where student teams from just any colleges in Boston they can come together and they can choose either education or healthcare track and they can design a product from zero to one. So that was kind of the idea and then at the very end they'll present their presentation to a panel of judges and then we'll choose a winner and then yeah. winner gets prizes. So nice, nice. that's kind of the, the competition. That's good. Um... What was I saying? Uh, one second. Oh yeah, I also kind of did something similar in um, my college as well. It was like a design, um, it was a design hackathon. So basically we created a design mm -hmm. hackathon and we also had like, you know, different, um, like different um, tracks for people as well. We got some like amazing mm -hmm. submissions too. We had like this one person do like a virtual uh, design thing where she like created it so like you could make like virtual drawings and leave them in places. Mm -hmm. It was really cool. Oh, that's so sick. <laughs> yeah. That's fire. Yeah. yeah. Well, this year we, we didn't have any virtual submissions, but uh, yeah, I feel like that would be so cool to have. Um, if someone has an Apple Vision Pro, then maybe that's, um, they can just demo it during their presentations, but... Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm, we're actually, I'm working on creating, like, a company for Apple Vision Pro. It's called Tangible, mm -hmm. and it's like a budgeting app, too. I'm gonna show mm -hmm. it to you later and kind of get your thoughts yeah. and ideas, but... I also wanted to ask you, like, how did you get into product design? Like, you know, why did you get into product design? What's the story? Mm. So yeah, it started, I guess, back in high school. Um, I was doing a lot of fine arts back in high school, and I basically touched any, most of the medium that you can think of, so watercolor, oil paint, so 3D printing, ceramics, and that was like, I don't know, I was the type of kid that would like live in art studios just to like draw stuff and like get things done. And so that was my high school. And then after that, I was like, I don't know if I wanna, or I don't know if I can do fine art full time because it is really challenging right. uh, to, you know, earn money as, a, as an artist. Right. Um, and so I got into Tufts not knowing about product design at all. And I talked to this alum who studied a major called human factors engineering. Essentially, it's another term for UI, UX, or user experience design. And when I heard that, I was like, oh, that's really interesting. It kind of blends in my art background a little bit, but I can 
learn computer science, I can learn psychology, and I guess it, it feels more tangible because ultimately design, I can help solve problems, whereas like I guess art is more, it's a lot about what I want to express, uh, it's a lot of self, self-expression, and so yeah, after, so I majored, right now I'm majoring in that, I'm wrapping up my final semester at Tufts, and yeah, that's kind of how I got into product design and just been doing it since freshman year, which is like, I guess like, yeah, three, four years ago. That's good, that's good. Um, I kind of got into it a similar way as well. Like I was into art and I was really into like video editing back in the day. Like I was trying to create Mm -hmm. a documentary and then I eventually just ended up, you know, like talking to my school counselor and being like, hey, um, what's some good career paths? I think I did this in college, actually. I was in college and I was like, oh, mm-hmm. what? I, I, I'm gonna go into computer science, but I don't like computer science. My parents want me to do computer science. And then mm-hmm. eventually I was like, no, I'm not doing computer science. So the counselor was like, no, just go into, go into something else. So they eventually told me about like UX, UI design. They were like, have mm-hmm. you thought it just came and oh, went oh. off? But yeah, that happens. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. But um, what oh, you were okay. saying, um, you were talking about so like architecture and a lot of t- the sc- people from your school. Yeah, yeah, architecture, con- cognitive brain science, so like a bit of psychology. Yeah, so a lot of yeah, a lot of different backgrounds uh, come see. into UX, and yeah, it's it's interesting. To, to see different types of people come together. Yeah, I love like hearing about everyone's backgrounds in UX. It's super interesting. But I also wanted to know like, what made you start uh, Not Just Pixels? What was the, what compelled you? Mm. Yeah. Uh, first off, uh, before I started, I was, I was, well, I listen to podcasts every day and it's, it's such a huge part of my life in general and so there was this podcast by I think a user research platform called Maze and it was called The Optimal Path. Uh, I don't know if you heard it before but essentially be- even before I started they they just launched like their first like five episodes and it was like brand new and I was listening to the conversations I was like I remember like, at the time I was like whoa this is, like this is so sick like if I can just like invite people that I admire or people that I like and then I can just record conversations and there's like two of them into podcasts like I, maybe you can do that one day and so that's kind of where the idea planted um, its seeds in me and I guess after that it was just uh, and also I just felt like there weren't that many podcasts about like how to land design internships at specific companies like I'm sure you know that I have some episodes where it's like how to land a design internship at Meta, Google, yeah. different startups, different companies. Uh, and it was like, uh, there are not that many resources like that out there. And I want to know what, I guess also for a little bit selfish reason, I was going through that process as well. And so I was like, maybe this is a chance for me to talk to different people, understand what the process is. And along with recording that, I can, uh, I can share those insights with people who are also applying as well. And so I would be, but I would be lying to say that like I started immediately after the idea. I think there was a lot of like, I think like probably like a solid half of a year. I was just like kind of doubting myself. I was like, uh, I don't know. I, I never done this before. I'm not sure about my own voice. Like, I don't know if people are going to be on this. And so this was like a good half month where I was just like, I don't know, finding different excuses for myself to <laughs> push back the release date and stuff. And eventually I was like, I mean, I gotta do it. Like I've recorded, I think like four or five episodes. And that was like, I can, I can start with that. And then went through a lot of fun branding work for the podcast, like coming up with the name, the colors, the, the thumbnails and everything. And then I think launched in like beginning of May and done that for around more than a year so far yeah um i actually so i was looking for like design podcasts and 
I couldn't find anything except yours so I ended up like listening to yours and I was thinking like wow it was so professionally done um, it was so like well thought through and also the branding's on point too the branding's great uh, I love it mm, um, I actually wanted to know like so some of my favorite episodes are like with Mike Mai like he was the designer yeah, on there um, who's yeah. like who are some of your like most favorite guests or not even favorite mm -hmm. guests but like what were the most yeah. fun conversations I guess yeah Mike is definitely up there uh, he is <laughs> he's a character uh, he is very fun uh, to be around he was the first person that really taught me about accessibility in design like he is a big accessibility advocate like even to this day like i'm redesigning my portfolio same and when i'm doing that i'm always thinking like is this like accessible like what if like mike is just like right behind me like what would he say like yeah. it's kind of crazy uh how much impact he had uh other than mike i'm trying to think um two come to mind and not this is not to undermine any of the guests. These are no. just ones that come up on the top of my head. First one is Kat Small, who currently works at Dropbox. She, I don't know, it's just her energy and also, uh, yeah, we, I remember like in the very beginning of the episode, like we were kind of joking about like, we just kept pushing off the episode recording day just because both of us had stuff going on. Um, and then she's, she's just super open about like, uh, her experience and also she's very open to helping junior designers. Um, but yeah, sorry, were you gonna add something there? No, I I'm just saying I remember this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, Kyle was, yeah, Kyle was really fun. The other one is Kyle Turman, who when I recorded, he was working at Retool, and I think now he works at uh, Anthropic. Uh, I might be butchering the name of the company, but essentially it's an AI infrastructure company. Gotcha. And, I think that conversation was memorable because I've been wanting to talk to him for like for for so long. Like and it was actually Kat who introduced me to him. And it just worked out because Kat and Kyle worked in the same company at Z before. And so she was she introduced me to Kyle and I was like, oh my god, I've wanted to talk to him for so long. So it must be a really good conversation just about I'm trying to think what we talked about uh, principles of good design. Uh, he wrote an article back when he was at Slack. Um, I think also we, we also talked about architecture as well, which I forgot how we talked about that, but it, it was related to design and it was just in general a very good conversation. Uh, I see. And so yeah, I would say these are the ones that stood out. Yeah, but I don't know if you, do you have any uh, of your favorites or, or ones that you remember? The ones that I remember are like Mike Mai, first of all, and then I think I remember she worked, I remember mm -hmm. Kat as well, um, because I thought she had great mm -hmm. energy. Um, I remember another person, she was talking more about like balance, I forget her name, um, but she was mm -hmm. talking about like balance and how she um, shifted from more like designing things to more design strategy, um, mm -hmm. and that was interesting as well i found that to be pretty interesting and then there's a few um excuse it like sorry if i sound a little nasally i have like oh. a cold um oh no but it's okay like, no, no i'll feel I, it's just like a seasonal thing I, i'm sure i'll feel fine but um no the thing is that i also remember like some of the interns as well there was like a mm. um there was this one where it was about landing an internship at meta um, so I mm. listened to this episode. I've listened to a lot of your episodes like on runs. So like I'll go like mm. I used to do like oh, wow. 10 miles and That's I sick. just I was just like listening it to it in the background of the run so I'd mm. like because like after a few miles you go into a, like kind of a more meditative state because in the beginning when you're doing a run you can't like 
concentrate so you can only like listen to music and whatnot yeah. but then after you hit a few miles you're, you're like able to you know you kind of yeah. just able to focus a little bit better so you can listen so i'd always play it when i was ready to like focus so like the last few miles would be your podcast yeah. and, then, <laughs> and then i'd go That's home so cool. <laughs> and then i'd go home and um listen to it or see like if there's more that i can understand from it um mm -hmm. but yeah there's so many good episodes i listened to like a lot of the beginning episodes um mm. and i think i listened uh, you know just so like before you came on i wanted to like see what the, the where the podcast was um mm. i think i heard the recent one it seems like you guys have a new host yes yeah well so that that was interesting because uh so her name is mira and she uh sh so she reached out to me after we recorded the linkedin design internship episode and she was like oh i'm also into i want to get into content creation and i want to get into podcast creation and so she kind of joined as i guess like a um i don't want to uh, like a part-time or I guess like just another host and so he uh, we would like hop on calls and discuss about like okay what are some of the things that she can do and one of the ideas was that uh, she wants to talk to people who work in different types of companies so for example startups agency big tech I guess these are like the big categories and so she basically initiated these conversations recorded them and so, so yeah, she recorded, I think, about like four or five of them. Um, and yeah, I think I, so far I released one, which is the one with Rachel uh, from Skill AI. And there's a few more, but I'm still debating whether I have the time to like edit all of them because it's, it's a lot. I see. Um, and yeah. I see. So... How does like your process work? How do you find the guests? How do you do the, how do you like, you know, create the podcast? And then what do you do for editing mm -hmm. as well? Yeah, it's, it's a process that I, I mean, at the, at the beginning, I had no idea what I was doing. I was like, but I really wanted to like have a good process down. And I'm sure with your stream as well, um, you probably have your own set of processes and, um, but so for for mine, um, it's usually a mix of like I reach out to through email or through LinkedIn, or something that I do is I go on ADP list, which for people that don't know is a yeah. design, is a platform that you know people can book this, like calls with industry professionals and in design. You can for designers, PMs, uh, product managers, and so I would use that sometimes. Uh, just to get an excuse to hop on a call with someone. It's actually pretty effective. Uh, and so I use different types of outreach methods, methods to try to get their attention and try to see if they're interested. And after that, I will hop on a first call with them. And before the first call, I'll draft up like essentially an episode agenda. So I'll write down the times, um, well, not the times, but I guess like all the questions I want to ask, the thumbnail, I'll also, uh, actually, I don't know if I created that, probably just the questions. I'll have the questions and also like the broad themes ready so that in the call I can be like, okay, here's what I want to discuss with you, you know, all the questions. Once, if they're chill with that and I feel like the vibe is right, then we'll actually schedule a time for the recording. And normally I'll just send a Google Calendar link with a, so I use something called Zencaster, which is a recording platform. There's also a ton out there, but uh, so I'll send them that link, and then also a fully, I see a full like episode agenda with the thumbnails, the question, the time, just any important information. And yeah, after that we just hop on the call, record it. The good part about Zencaster is that I can, when I download the audio, it's mine and the guest is separate so there's no like overlap so it's actually it's it's a lifesaver for editing uh and so after that i recorded i downloaded and then i use i used to have a windows laptop so i use something called audacity uh, which is yeah i use that to edit uh my recordings 
and I normally have a folder of like all the like the the intro songs, the closing, the the transition, uh, even the background when I'm like introducing the guests. Like all of these, I'll have these ready, and yeah, I'll just edit edit the podcast. Um, after that, I'll, you know, tweak up and write the show details and you know all these like miscellaneous work, and then. Yeah, after that, I'll be like, okay, I want to schedule on this day to publish, and then I'll do that. And then once that's done, I will reach out to the guests, say like, hey, this episode is live. You can check it out via this link. Nice. So, yeah, but that, yeah, it, it is definitely a lot of like behind the scenes work to like get to the actual recording itself. Um, but yeah, it's, I feel like it's pretty necessary, especially for like, when people are really busy, like, for example, like Kat or Kyle, like when they're like at that level, I feel like it's just, yeah, I just do it so that they can feel more prepared and also to be more respectful of their time. But that's kind of the, the long process that I go through. I see, I see. Um, that sounds like a lot of work. How do you like manage it with, you know, your schedule, especially since you're at yeah. Tufts? Yeah. Um, uh, so I, I have a Notion, Notion uh, page just with all the guests and I keep track of each of their statuses, whether that's about to record, uh, recording date scheduled, uh, waiting for the response, like statuses like that. And so that helps me keep track. I also have a content calendar, so it tells me when's the recording or like when and a specific episode is going to go live. Um, and so that that is super helpful. Um, class, so I guess like that, I managed that a little bit differently from my classes. Um, but I guess like in terms of priority, I would always try to finish my classwork before hopping into like podcast stuff and also just like side projects and things. I guess the only good part is that the thing with my major, like the classes normally are project based, so they're not like yeah. super intensive on the workload, which is really nice. Yeah. So I guess that's also why I had the time that's to nice. create the podcast. That's nice. Um, how did you like get, I guess, like longevity and how did you kind of build, you know, a, mm. an audience for it? Yeah. Uh, so I use LinkedIn, well at the time I used LinkedIn a lot for most of my promotions and um, longevity, I think that one is interesting because I, I read a lot of articles before I created and what, I think one of the best advice that I got or at least I read is even before you start you should brainstorm 25 different episodes for a single podcast and so I did that. And I was like, okay, this is actually pretty doable. I can think of an array of guests, an array of companies out there in the world where I can interview people. And so once that's done, I feel like it was pretty natural in the sense that, okay, I kind of know what the direction of the podcast is going to be. Um, in terms of consistency, I feel like accountability is really helpful, especially after I launched like, about like 10 episodes. There's an innate pressure, or I guess like push in me that that's like, okay, I need to get to editing, I need to start reach out to people, or else some people that are listening won't have their next episode next Tuesday. Like, right. part of it is like that, and also I just want to try to be as consistent as possible. So I think a mix of these two things, um, self drive and also accountability, really helped. I see. Um, but yeah, it, it is hard. It is very hard. Yeah. Um, how do you feel it, like, what type of um, mindset shift, if you had to make one, um, would you say you had to make to become more like a content creator versus just a product designer? Because I know, like, mm -hmm. product designers, we just need to know, like, a few set of skills and then, you know, we're kind of good. Yeah. But being a content creator, especially like a design content creator, is a whole new ball game. How did you adjust to that? Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I think I think the first one is definitely just not being afraid to put yourself out there. And I think that's such a hard 
thing to do. I think my first exposure or experience to that was during my gap year. Um, at the time, I love I love going to cafes, and so I created this Instagram blog um, where I will like basically document all the cafes that I've been to in Taiwan, which is where I was from. And I remember there was this specific post where I was like feeling pretty down that day, and so that post was really memorable because I feel like that was my first ever public post of like just me sharing like I guess more negative things and just like kind of putting myself out there. And it's a very interesting experience because right after I hit post, like I felt so much better, just mentally and also just how I felt at the moment. And I think that was definitely a big hurdle of like I was like oh, I don't know if people, what people are gonna think of this like I never write this type of content but I think mentally it was a big leap for me to do that at the time and I think that definitely was a really good stepping stone for like post like any of the other like more content creation projects I've done because I felt like after that I was like. Even though there will be hurdles, I feel like I'll be fine putting myself out there and like sharing stuff. Um, yeah, and I think I guess another part is just um, focusing on helping other people. I think my podcast that was part of it. I guess it's more like I wanted to talk to these people, but also it's like I want to share these conversations. I think especially the internship episodes, like they're most. Fundamentally, they're very practical and also just like I want to help you get these internships. And so when I have that in mind, I I feel like I'm more I have the goal of helping other people with these content. Um, and so it's easier for me to like put myself out there and then try to do these different projects or or create content. I see. Yeah. See, that makes sense. Yeah, you're definitely adding a lot of value to the space. I feel like, um, Thank you. I feel like you also stand out very, like, you have like a really good brand and you stand out. And I was just like wondering, like, how do you, like, what advice do you have for, you know, designers looking to brand themselves and stand out? And, you know, like, there's so many designers out there, so many great designers. How do you like build yeah. your own brand, stand out, you know? Yeah. Um, well, I can share my thoughts on this. I'm, I'm curious to hear yours as well, but um, I think for me, obviously, the first thing is that you have to you have to post first and foremost, and also I think the the content of your posts is also important and to me i feel like a guiding light for anything that i post or i don't think about this consciously every time but um i don't know if you're familiar with it. the author called james clear he wrote atomic habits which yeah. is yeah um and so i remember he had this quote that said uh, i'm probably gonna butcher it um essentially the core concept is don't write to impress, but write to be useful. And that's always stuck with me because like, like I want my content, which is anything I write or publish to be useful to people. And when I have that in mind, I think that's, I don't know, it's, it's I think the brand and also the, the, how people think of you comes, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of like a side effect of just like putting out good work and also just trying to be helpful and useful to people um I, like i would be lying to say that i very caught like i think about the brand all the time and like um but i do think about like what i put out there and also whether it's helpful and useful or not and so um yeah i mean i would recommend if, if designers do want to go to content creation as a way of like expressing themselves like I think I would definitely recommend posting either on LinkedIn or I'm trying to do more on Twitter. I think Twitter is really interesting, uh, or X. I'll never get used to that. Uh, it's such a, yeah, interesting name, uh, I'll put it that way. Uh, yeah, like putting yourself out there because um, it's how people see you. Like, I know, uh, what am I trying to, like it's, 
I think putting yourself out there helps people to like just see your level of work and also what you want to say as a designer and practicality wise like if people are looking for a candidate for a role like if they seen your interface design or if they seen some of the articles that you wrote they have a better sense of who you are as a candidate um and so maybe that can remove one round interview or even like get you through the door to a specific company if the things that you're writing aligns with maybe their values or the things that they care about um but i would say definitely don't do that as your goal i think mo mostly just like as i said like write stuff that's useful and also yeah just try to be helpful um as possible and obviously you can share the work that you're proud of as well um which i know a lot of people do on twitter they share their designs um yeah which i, I probably should do as well soon yeah um i kind of share my designs on twitter um i would say the best thing actually really my thoughts about this is more like you should do what's like authentic to you so for you like making a spotify podcast is authentic for me like mm -hmm. being on twitch is kind of authentic because i feel like that fits my personality fits like the way i work a lot of times i just do do like work sessions on twitch so like there's mm -hmm. two people in my community that are like big 3d modeling fans so they mm -hmm. like help me out with 3d modeling and i've actually like so like made things from uh like i actually want to show you too and also i might have mm. to send you another zoom link because they might oh yeah yeah, I, saw they might, yeah oh, they might get... with zoom. I know yeah. um but i like made a bunch of things through um you know like with the help of my community mm -hmm. um they just show us like how to do things so that's mm -hmm. kind of what i was so excited about so i just wanted to show you there's yeah. so we're making this app called tangible and mm -hmm. we're making it so that <clears throat> it's like a budgeting app right so you can like play with your money that's the idea and we have like this money oh, ball wow. um right now it's still like in the bubble gum and tape phase so like you're able to drag mm -hmm. it but um i was struggling so hard to make this ball um mm -hmm. because you had to like put like a bunch of dollar bills around the ball and yeah. the thing is with this i actually ended up like having to so i'll show you like there was i'll show you the, oh, the beginning use blender. yeah you, i use blender and i ended up having like a bunch of these dollar bills but if you look at like the geometry of them it's like see like every dollar bill oh. has so many vertices like so much geometry going on so oh, when we I tried see. to transfer it to the other program it was like bro you have too much geometry like <laughs> what are you doing um so oh, i ended up so i ended up making a whole other dollar bill that's a lot more simpler um and looks better because somebody in my community mm. showed me how to do this and now i'm oh. gonna use this and put it on the ball later um not yet but like pretty soon because i have other oh. things i'm working on i'm gonna say don't say that's really sick yeah and well, this, yeah. thank you and there's also like so we're creating this app called tangible i just want to show you kind of the the storyboard we created for it and just see mm -hmm. like your thoughts and ideas because we are going to do user testing on it soon we're trying to get it mm -hmm. into we're trying to get it into the app store um i actually have to call the app store today um so oh. that they review it quickly um but we submitted it recently so we have it laid out so that I just show you like how it works basically. So, oh, if Figma will load, <laughs> I hate it when it does that. Um, yeah. hold on one second. My computer may be like. Oh, did it crash? No, it, it didn't crash. I just um, I exited out of it because sometimes my computer it's like running a few things because of twitch mm -hmm. as well so yeah 
But basically we have like the whole storyboard laid out on how it works. I'm trying to get, I'm trying to get it to zoom in. Oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, it's nice. So we have like the landing flow. So people come in, they learn about the gestures. And the idea is like, you can uh, take money out of the ball and then you see like you can like zoom in and see how much money you have like in stack form or in the ball and then you can like make different balls from the money so you can play around with it and then you can like rotate it um but you basically start out by entering how much money you have in the ball and you can like put money in the ball and then we also want to make it so that you can make it so the ball becomes just stacks so i laid it out for the developer um we're st we still have to like make all of this through the updates but we have it right now so you can drag the ball that's like the mm -hmm. part that's the place we're at and we're also like remaking the ball and adding a whole different module so yeah Wow, that's really cool. Are you working with uh, another engineer? I'm working with a this? dev. Yeah, I'm working mm -hmm. with like a dev mm -hmm. who knows how to do um, like Xcode and you know, like just like no Swift basically. So mm -hmm. I'm working with a dev. They know how to do like all the, so I do all the design. I do, I make all the mm -hmm. assets, but then they make all the, you know, like the dev stuff. But yeah, it's just a little thing we're doing on the side. It's super cool. But yeah. yeah, there might be... Yeah, back in high school I did a lot of 3D modeling, so... This really brings me back. I was using Rhino, uh, which is uh, another 3D modeling tool. And uh, yeah, I was like building spaceships. Uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun. So it's, it's cool to see you're also doing 3D modeling stuff as well. Yep. Oh, somebody in chat asked me, do you have a feature to stack it all in $1 bills for research purposes, of course, lol. No, we don't have that, we don't have that, um, feature, but, um, but yeah, um, we do not have that feature for now. Maybe one day when we feel like yep. killing ourselves through dev, yes, we could have that. <laughs> um, yeah. I'm also gonna send you another Zoom link because oh my god, why? <laughs> um, can you see if you can like what if it kicks it kicks you out? Can you see if you can like log back into this one again? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. If not, I'll just send you a different link. But also, I kind of want to also ask you how do you say how would you um recommend like building your design community so like for anybody who's looking to build a community what would you recommend Ooh. um yeah i'm trying to um i guess for me it's interesting because i i guess i never really intentionally try to build a community i guess it's more of to me like I don't even know if I have a community, but more just like people that consume my content or like read my stuff, but just based on like the community. Okay. His name is Guo and he runs a podcast called Not Just Pixels um, on Spotify. So if you want to check out his stuff, it's here called Not Just Pixels. Let me go on LinkedIn again. Oh my god, that's so annoying. Admit. Yay, you're, you're yeah. back. <laughs> nice, okay. But you were saying. Uh, yeah. yeah, I was saying, uh, uh, trying to, oh yeah, I think, uh, it's, I know most of the design communities I know are on Discord. Um, so maybe that's one platform to target. I mean, if I do ever in the future 
create some sort of design community, I would probably also do it on Discord as well. And community, I think also goes back to the point of like being useful and helpful, I guess, trying to think of different ideas, like hosting workshops or like having different speakers or um, maybe even like fun events because ultimately want to create a fun space for people to learn and also um, to maybe hosting game nights or like, um, I don't know if there, the thing about design is that I don't think there are that many like design focused games, most of them are very nerdy, like try to guess this shade of color or like, yeah. uh, like just like these like extremely nerdy design games, uh, so I, I don't know if these are fun at all. Um, but yeah, so I think a mix of like useful content and also just like a little play uh, and game nights would be nice. Um, yeah, so I think, I guess it's more on like the practicality of how to actually create a form of design community, like Design Buddies is yeah. really popular one. Um, what else are there? There's one called Boba, uh, Boba Talks, which is not design, but I think it's more for product management, but it's also a very playful and also just seems like a super chill community. Uh, I'm trying to think what else I've been... Um, yeah, I think these are probably like design or like there's one, there, there's a product manager that I follow called Chloe Xi, and she has her own Discord server, and that one is also really playful. And so I, I feel like that direction is the type that I do want to create if I create one in the future. But yeah. Do you actually like get people, I'm sure you get like a lot of feedback for from people from your podcast, but how do you like receive that? How do you, um, you know? Like, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you interact with people, basically? Yeah, um, I'm trying to, uh, nothing specific, um, it's, uh, I'm hesitating because I remember there was one comment that was, uh, that was more on, like, improvement side of things, but for some reason I can't remember exactly what it is. I think it was about the structure of the, the podcast or something. Um, but yeah, when, when, I, when I get more like constructive and also just things I can improve, I normally would obviously thank them and because they have no reason to do that, but they did it anyways. And so, um, but most of the comments mostly are like, uh, this podcast episode helped me at least get my foot in the door in this company or like I find this really helpful and so I would say it's very lucky and also I'm, I'm very grateful that most of the comments has been positive and yeah it also feels it's nice to feel that way especially considering that the work that I put into each of these episodes and also how I get these guests and so yeah I'm, I'm just glad that most of them are positive and yeah, and if, if it's, yeah, I wouldn't say if it's not positive, but most of them are like constructive and I'm able to know what to do. I see. To that. I see. Yeah. Did you ever get like a comment that you found like super uplifting or just like kept you going, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I used to do this when I first started, but I used to, this might, this sounds so weird. But it was actually really helpful in the sense that whenever somebody says something nice about the podcast, I would like screenshot it and then just put in like my literal like Notion page. Uh, I don't do that anymore, but I, I used to do that in the beginning and it's it's so helpful for just motivation and yeah, it really just keeps you going. Because I also have another blog and so that also helps. Uh, helps as well. So when people say either the blog or the podcast, I'll just screenshot it and then put it on my nice. notion page. Yeah. Nice. I um recently like one of my like viewers, I was like struggling to do something. I couldn't get this mm -hmm. for the life of me while I was designing. Yeah. Um and he just like records a video for me of how to do it and sends it to me. 
And then Whoa. I was like, wow, this is so, this is so sweet. I was like, oh my god, no. I'm gonna cry. <laughs> I have to keep doing this because what will happen to this guy? <laughs> mm. You know? Oh, that's so awesome. But yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah, I guess the thing is that when you're putting stuff out there, like, you never know how it's gonna impact other people. And so when stuff like that happens, it's, yeah, it's really rewarding and it feels really nice. Yeah, um, someone from my chat is asking you, who is Grow's ideal non-design podcast guest? Oh, that is such an interesting question. Uh, non-design guest? Uh, hmm. Kind of thing. Um, I feel like there's, there's quite a handful actually. Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna say the one that comes up on the top of my head because I was listening to uh, to their conversation. Uh, Jamie Fox or Tim Ferris. I was listening to their podcast episode. Tim Ferriss would just because like he is probably one of the most prolific podcast creator like ever. Jamie Foxx for I just want to learn how he talks. Like he is probably like the way he tells stories and like his storytelling skills is is so good. And another person is probably I haven't watched uh I don't know if he's Oppenheimer or Oppenheimer. Um Robert Downey Jr. is also, he's just so good at telling stories and I remember like every speech that he gives, like he just like grabs the audience attention and like you never feel bored listening to him. Like I think that is, uh, I just want to learn that from these people. If it's only. fascinating. Yeah, it is like, I feel like it's either innate or that they train for it. It is, it's just really cool. Um, just how they talk their cadence like i can never feel bored listening to jeremy fox or robert Downey jr like telling stories um and so yeah these are the i guess the most recent examples because i've been listening to yeah the podcast with the videos but yeah. yeah no i think um for me personally like the twitch streamer that i like really mm. look up to is hasanabi hasan piker um, I don't know if you know who that is, but he's a guy who came on Twitch, and Twitch is like mainly like gamers, right? So that's like who yeah. your audience is for, but he did like, um, like he did, um, political streaming, and he talked about oh. like political events, and then obviously he branched out and he does like a lot of reaction videos and fun things like mm -hmm. that too but he started talking about politics on twitch and he got huge so he's like a mm -hmm. big person on twitch one of the most subscribed to twitch streamers but he doesn't do gaming so that's like how i got mm -hmm. the idea i was like why don't i just become the design and like the hasanabi of design you know just go on twitch start that. doing design don't like it, it's not about gaming anymore you're gonna stand out because you're like a non-gamer um Right. But that was yeah. my, that was kind of like my strategy, but also I enjoy, um, I enjoy Twitch streaming, so that's mm -hmm. also why mm -hmm. I do this, but yeah. That's super sick. Yeah, that reminds me, well first off, I feel like doing anything political content is just so hard. Yeah. Uh, because I would say like that's probably like one of the most polarizing uh -huh. topics you can, like, people well, people can have very clear sides uh, and things that they see right or wrong in these situations. And uh, second point, that brings me to another non-design guest that I would love to talk to, which is Trevor Noah. Oh. Uh, yeah, he is obviously a comedian. Also, the way he talks stories. Um, I've been to one of his comedy shows and I it was so funny. Uh, yeah, it was like, one of the very few, um, I haven't been to that many, but like that one really cracked me up and he's just, he's very funny, very down to earth and yeah, I think it just goes back to the art of talking and 
how to grab people's attention, how to tell stories. I feel like the people that I talked about all have this, they have the, their way of talking that is interesting and appealing to people, but yeah. Basically they're charismatic. He's, I feel like he's one of the, yeah, the charisma. Um, and yeah, that reminded, your example reminded me of Trevor Noah because I feel like he's one of the comedians that can blend. Uh, like he also talks a lot about <laughs> politics, but in a way that's like funny and also like also current views as well. So, yeah. Yeah. That'd be really surreal. Um, Don't mind me coughing. <laughs> it's just. I don't know. Okay, no, no, no. Yeah. But, um, no, yeah. Somebody again in my chat said like our DJ like Robert Downey Jr. would be so cool. What a life. Um, but yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, also, so I'll probably fight uh, first if, yeah, <laughs> if that happens. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah, crazy. I also just wanted to ask you. So there's like another question that I like need to ask you, which is, mm -hmm. um, what skill do you think is so important for like designers to have? Like, what's the most important skill that a designer needs to have in today's landscape? Yeah. Um... <laughs> Uh, one that comes to the top of my mind is how fast you learn new things, and I know that sounds extremely abstract, but uh, we can give a more concrete example. For example, like ChatGPT, or there's like there's one called Galileo that just came out recently, yeah. where it's like you can turn like text into yeah wireframes. Um, I think. Being able to understand what it is and also potentially find ways to make a workflow a little bit faster. You don't necessarily have to use it, but I think just understanding how it's going to impact your work and also how you can maybe use it in your day to day, I think that's really helpful um, because I feel like AI is going to... Uh, I haven't really put that much thought into this. I was thinking of writing maybe an article so I can like sit down and reflect, but just like the impact of AI on designers and also like our future. Um, so yeah, I think back to the question, I think the ability to learn new things really quickly, I think is definitely an important one. Um, I guess for junior designers, that and also the ability to just get stuff done. Like it sounds so simple, but like I remember like, Somebody asked like Barack Obama on an interview, and then he literally asked the same questions. Did you like, what would you recommend to people who are just starting their roles? And then he thought for a second, and then he was like, just learn how to get stuff done. Like when managers give you something, you're the type of person that's like, okay, I can handle this. I'll finish this by this day, and I'll get it done. And like, I feel like that's like, that's so like, and I think it's these things that like really makes a difference because one, it, it makes you a lot more accountable and you're a much more responsible person for sure. Um, but yeah, so I think, yeah, learning fast, getting stuff done. Um, yeah, I would say the tools isn't as important anymore. It's more about like, you can use Figma, you can use Sketch, you can use Adobe XD. Uh, you can use Midjourney, which is an image generation tool for AI. I think mostly it's just like what makes your workflow faster and also you can like be more efficient. I think that's a little bit before, like, um, And yeah, I guess that's more for like junior designers and I'm still learning because I haven't even, I'm starting my new role in after graduation in like August. So I feel like, yeah, if you ask me the same question, maybe like next year this time, I'll probably have a very different answer. But That's this true. is what I thought so far. That's true. I um, I actually agree with you. I feel like I have a really um, sometimes like you know when you start a new project. So I started like three D modeling like this year. So I started like a few mm. months ago, and I had a really hard time in the beginning because I was like, oh, I have to get all these things done, and I have no idea how to do this. I have absolutely no idea like it was so daunting mm, too yeah. but then you just like go through a bunch of tutorials you play around with the program and you figure it out and then you mm -hmm. i mean in 3d design it's like you 
do things like you try to do it this way you fail like three times and then you try again three more times and then you eventually yeah. you get it and then you could run up against a problem and then you have to like find another angle um so it can be very complicated but i definitely think like learning how to get it done is something you have to like get good at so you have to learn mm -hmm. to so it's like time management um you know like efficiency um, yeah. And also definitely learning how to learn. I think that's such an underrated skill. Uh, no one talks about how, like, like you know in school they just teach you things, but like, in the real world yeah, it doesn't yeah. work that way. You have to go teach yourself. <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. I think especially with design as well. Like, I've, I've heard so many people say that they learn design by themselves, not by taking uh, a formal class. Um, like they do it by doing projects or, um, yeah, mostly I would say like, to me, the best way to learn is through projects because then you're more motivated and also you learn relevant skills that's actually applicable to the stuff that you're doing, which is how I start, started, honestly. I, I love doing projects, um, whether that's like actual design projects or like design adjacent project, which is like my blog and also my podcast and then, um, but yeah, a mix of these help. Yeah, yeah um, definitely help you learn. Do you remember like your first design project? I do. Uh, it was back in high school. We were learning Adobe XD at the time. That was my first exposure. I created. Uh, I created two different apps. One was called Aqua. And it's funny because when I went back to my high school this winter, my art teacher actually still remembers that project that I created. Uh, like he was like, oh, like, remember the, the design project called Aqua? And I was like, oh my God, like, I, that's, that was like so long ago. Um, but yeah, so that, that one is essentially like an app that helps you track your water intake and then it has this like fancy water animation, which I was so proud of when I created that in Figma. Um, the other one was a course selection mobile app, um, but yeah, it is, like, the design is atrocious, like, I would not, I would not go back to look at that, um, but I guess, it's, if I feel bad looking at it, then that means that I have grown in some way as a designer, so, um, but I haven't seen the designs for a while, so. I remember mine, mine's were absolutely atrocious they were like they were so bad yeah. it was just like an app to i think i just created the login too i was like oh i'm just gonna create a login it was like a mobile gallery app and mm -hmm. i just created the login and i called it a day <laughs> And then I created something yeah. much better afterwards. And then like, I went from like zero to a hundred from this one project I created. Mm. It's called like elements. So basically I like, I, you know, made something based off of Pokemon Go. So instead of mm. just like, you know, having it so that you um, collect Pokemon, you collect items and then you can build stuff with those items. Mm. So that was kind of the mm -hmm. idea behind it. But yeah, it was like That's one of my, it. it was my first projects. I don't know if I still have it though, but I would show it to you, but yeah. Oh, yeah, I would, I would be down to see it. Yeah, it's always interesting to see. Oh wait, I think I have it. Is. One second. Can I show it mm. to you? It's possible. Mm. Of course. Okay. Let me share. I do want to be like, respectful of your time though so soon i will ask you my last question for the stream yeah sounds good oh that was also on xd yeah that's that's also how you that's know it's funny. like one of my first ones mm -hmm. because it's on xd because everything now is on figma don't you think like figma is way better too yeah once i yeah, once I use Figma for a while, I cannot go back to XD. No, definitely can't. There's like so many files with this um, one project too, because I made a bunch of versions of it. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. Good lord. Uh, 
Switch 3, but also 3D modeling. I yeah. think that's, that's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> for, for a MacBook. Yep, it so is. Props for for the for the laptop to do that. I try, yeah, I try doing like Cinema 40 on MacBook, and then it just it crashes. It just died. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> or it takes like forever to render. Um, I actually it, mine is pretty good with that, but it's we're getting a new one, like. With, with, oh, like, nice. Okay, I can't do this right now. I'll do it in the time. Okay, yeah. I'm, but no, we're getting like a new one too. We're getting a new MacBook for uh, like the company I'm starting and stuff. So mm -hmm. um, I'm just That's like, awesome. but I'm, you know, crossing fingers that Blender won't crash nearly as much. <laughs> um, it's been pretty yeah. good, but sometimes it crashes. And. Mm. Sometimes you just lose all your work. Those are oh, like that's the worst. I know. It's so crushing. Oh yeah, it is. Okay, I can't well, imagine. One time I like built out this whole thing, like the whole mm. like I built out like half of the model, and then it just crashes, and then I open mm. it, and it's like it's all gone, and I'm like, oh. Oh, okay, now I have to start uh, along work. with my soul. Yeah. It's also gone as yeah. Well. Oh my god. <laughs> Um, yeah. <laughs> my last question, I'm just gonna copy you, um, what advice do you have for, like, junior level, what's your, like, biggest mm -hmm. advice slash takeaway for junior level designers? Mm -hmm. Uh, don't, uh, I guess it's tricky, but the first thing that came to mind is don't wait to do stuff. Uh, and what I mean by that is, from what I understand for junior designers, a lot of it is like, whatever the manager tells you to do, you'll work on that. And obviously you have to do that to prove that you are worth it in the position and also maybe you're even better for a potential promotion. But I think my idea with that is more just, what can you do on top of the things that you're assigned? And you can either do the things that you're assigned, which puts you in a, a good position if you do well, but I feel like if you take initiatives on maybe things that people don't want to do or like, you know, things that you can do outside of your assigned task to like kind of put yourself ahead and maybe get your managers like more attention from the manager. Like I feel like, I feel like that's something that I definitely want to do, or at least I want to try out, is just being more proactive um, and doing things. Um, yeah, because I feel, I feel like, at least for me, like, my favorite type of people to work with is not the people that, you know, just do the things that I ask them to do, but more just like, okay, actually, i done the stuff I did, but here are some other ideas, and here's the thing that I feel like could be helpful, what do you think? And I feel like that just changes the whole dynamic because like now they're actually they're thinking, they're you know, being proactive. And so I would say that's probably the biggest thing. Another just the other one is focus on visual. Honestly, initially I was gonna say focus on visual design, but now with AI, I'm not hundred percent sure about that. Um, but I do think visual design is very underrated, especially with human designers. And what I mean by visual design is like traditional graphic design, like spacing, typography, fonts, colors, like does it actually look nice on a page or that, that is just, that is so important. Uh, um, and not to mention the UX design process is important as well, but I think, you know, we first impression is important, people like to see beautiful things, and that's right. where visual design can help a ton. Right. So, yeah. If not beautiful, at least design. like professional. Right, right. Professional looking. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, yeah, I, I'm trying to think who's... Perry Wang, I think that's his name. Uh, it, like, yeah. It, I'm, I'm assuming that you probably have probably seen his portfolio, maybe you've heard of him before, but yeah. He works at Discord, used to work at Google. His portfolio is probably one of the most, like, crisp and professional looking websites for new grads and junior designers I've ever seen that he was on this podcast and he said that one of the most underrated skill is visual design and yep. 
like for me in the craft. So yep. I think craft the craft is definitely important. Um, but yeah. Yep. Um, that's amazing advice. Uh, do you have another second? I actually did find my thing. Yeah. I'd like to show oh, it yes. to you. Um, yes. I did find it in the end. I had it somewhere here. So this is like a app I made called oh. Elements. It's like one of the first mm -hmm. ones I made, so it's still not like as nice as I like it. But basically you start out, so it's wow. like you have water, earth, fire, air. So like mm -hmm. a water location is like a lake, so you go to Albert Lake, and then that's you walking there. Oh, I love that. Oh, that's so cute. Yeah, and then oh, you nice. go there and you look around and you find a, like a, wow. you find this thing. So it's like you click on it, and you collect a bunch of items, and then wow. you could start like building items. Mm. So like you can use it, and then, oh, where do I go next? Oh, I click yes, and then you can like build a whole environment, and then I have them, I still didn't know how to do like good 3D design yet. And then you can mm. post the build too, and then wow. those are your builds. You can go see like Whoa. your steps too. So it's like a yeah. So you want to see your steps as well as like other people as well as the idea is like you try to get people to go out more by like having them collect things, and then you can mm. see like your friends' builds too. So wow. if, you, if you go on like somebody's. Somewhere you can go to like, oh yeah, and then you can also have like trade. I think um, mm -hmm. all builds. Wait, wait. You can trade with somebody, so you can like trade. Wow. And then yeah, and you can also see their builds and their inventory. Mm -hmm. So like, if you want to trade wow. with them. But yeah, I basically made this, and this is how I learned like visual design. So then you can mm -hmm. see like popular users popular items and then popular locations and you also have like a wish list like like things you want wait hold on but like my accessibility here is not good that's the one thing i can definitely say like my mm -hmm. accessibility here is just like not where it needs to be so you also have like a wish list like, wow. this is... so you can do like wish lists wow. but yeah but that's kind of like my first wow. one. Of, that's like one of my first uh, designs that I created in college. But everything mm -hmm. else now is probably going to be like more professional, more accessible. And I'm trying mm -hmm. to like learn how to just make it like more, you know, my stuff like now I'm trying to like make it more professional and also just more, I would say like, I, I would say I'm kind of like a design cheater. So like, I learned how to cheat. <laughs> I learned how to like do things without like ha learning how to do it properly in many cases. Um, so mm. I learned how to do things more like, you know, in the right way. You could say what really is the right way, but mm. um, you know, like I was learning Blender and I didn't learn. I didn't know how to do a lot of things, so I tried to like work around what I didn't know. But mm. I think mm -hmm. now yeah. I'm like honing in on like. Oh, just fill in the gaps, you know? So that's kind of like where I'm cool. at. But yeah. No, I love that. I mean, like, your first designs is like, or like a thousand X <laughs> better than my first one. <laughs> like, no, that okay. is, that, that's a crazy first design, and props to you for that. That's. It's I mean, not the very yeah. first, that's the thing. It's not like my very first or anything. It's more about like the one, it's like the one cornerstone one, I would say. Like the mm -hmm. one that like mm -hmm. taught me, I guess. It's like yeah. before yeah. this, I didn't know anything. Yeah. 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 We all have to start somewhere. I know. Um, I know, but, but like. Yeah. It's cool to see. Um, but yeah. Anyways, yeah. um,. I know that it's like 1140, so if you if you need to go somewhere, you can, or you can, you're welcome to stay as well and continue talking with me, up to you. Uh, I might have to hop off. I have another class in 
in a few minutes. So All right. I'll be head over pretty soon. All right. But, yeah. Thank you for inviting me. Thank this you is my first ever Twitch stream. Yeah, so. it was so fun. I enjoyed talking awesome. to you. It was really fun. Um, I would love to talk to you again sometime soon. Uh, we'll definitely keep in touch. And thank you so much for being my first guest. Thank you. <laughs> it was so Ooh. awesome. Anyways, yeah. see you. I've seen those confettis yeah. in the background playing. And like, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was super fun. Thank you for posting. And yeah, keep doing this. Um, we'll chat sometime soon. Thank you. See you, Guo. Have a good one. Yeah. Bye. Bye.